This forum address with Dr. David Magleby was given on May 19th, 2015. Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you here this morning for today's Distinguished Faculty Lecture, which also serves as our spring term campus forum. My name is Brent Webb, and President Worthen has asked me to, con to conduct today's forum. This morning, it will be our privilege to hear from David B. Magleby. Dr. Magleby is the 54th recipient of the Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Faculty Lecturer Award. His presentation today is entitled, The Necessity of Political Parties and the Importance of Compromise. Professor David Magleby received his BA from the University of Utah and his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. His scholarship centers on direct democracy, voter partisanship, and campaign finance. During his distinguished career, he has published 14 books and edited volumes and some 90 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. He has been a Fulbright Scholar and Congressional Fellow of the American Political Science Association. Professor Magleby received the BYU-sponsored Research Award, his research having been funded by the National Science Foundation and several private foundations. His work has been cited by Supreme Court justices. In 1990, he was appointed to U.S. Senate Advisory Committee. Dr. Magleby is the lead author of the introductory American politics text, Government by the People, now in its 26th edition. He received the BYU Mazur Distinguished Teaching Award, the Case Carnegie Foundation Award for Professor of the Year in Utah, and the Roman and Littlefield Award for Innovative Teaching in Political Science. In 1982, Professor Magleby, in partnership with the BYU Statistics and Communications Departments and other Utah colleges and universities, established the KBYU Utah Colleges Exit Poll, which for more than three decades has involved hundreds of students each election year. Professor Magleby served as chair of the Department of Political Science and as dean of the College of Family, Home, and Social Science. He was founding director of the Center for the Study of election, Elections and Democracy. He has been national president of the Political Science Honor Society, Pi Sigma Alpha. Brother Magleby is married to Linda Waters Magleby, and they have four children and four grandchildren. As a university, we are pleased this year to honor Dr. David Magleby with BYU's most prestigious faculty award the Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Faculty Award, and look forward now to hearing this traditional lecture that accompanies the award. Would you please join me in congratulating Professor David Magleby. Vice President Webb, other members of the administration, deans, colleagues, friends, and students, I'm honored and humbled to be recognized in this way. The occasion invites introspection and appreciation. Thank you. I have been greatly blessed by the opportunity to study, teach, and write for now 33 years on the faculty at Brigham Young University. There is a sense of mission about teaching at BYU, which for me is personified by you, the students, and your predecessors. Those I have known and taught in classes, those I have worked with as teaching or research assistants, and those who have been members of BYU wards or stakes in which I have served. You are smart and good. You have lifted me and my family. You motivate me to be a better person. You will do remarkable things in your families, the church, your community, and your occupation. I hope my remarks today will encourage you to make civic engagement a part of who you are. I teach in a discipline whose name some find presumptuous, political science. Politics and government seem so disorganized, messy, personal, and sometimes even evil that it can hardly be seen as science. Politics can be all of that, but as Alexander Hamilton put it in Federalist Paper No. 9, quote, the science of politics, like most other sciences, has received great improvement." Close quote. Similarly, James Madison wrote in Federalist No. 37 of political science, 
and science of government. Or as John Adams wrote to his wife Abigail in 1780, I must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain." Close quote. To Adams, Hamilton, Madison, Jay, and the other framers of our grand experiment with self-government, the data for their science came from their experience in colonial legislatures and the Continental Congress, and from their study of religion, history, and science. Think of the Constitution as an engineering blueprint for the design of a functioning and enduring government. By that standard, their blueprint has stood the test of time, and they were remarkable social scientists. Today, I would like to address two seemingly contradictory elements of politics that are relevant to our lives today and our times. Indeed, I would argue will always be relevant, the necessity of political parties and the importance of compromise. With respect to political parties, I will argue an idea widely accepted in political science that political parties are essential to modern democracy. This view runs counter to popular opinion, which is often anti-party. Concerns about parties include that they corrupt the participants, they foster contention and turn their supporters into unthinking followers rather than informed citizens. Today, I hope to persuade you uh, that parties serve important functions and that you should not only vote in elections, but become involved in political parties. How do parties facilitate democracy? First, parties organize democracy. They recruit and nominate the candidates. They structure the competition. Without them, voters would face the daunting task of choosing from among scores of candidates. In this sense, parties simplify democracy and voting. Parties, in a broad sense, stand for a particular view of the role of government. They stake out positions on issues like health care, energy, the environment, foreign and defense policy. The orientation of parties can change, and it is easier to change a party and its direction than it is to start a new party. As long as the political system is competitive, the two parties will tend to remain moderate. Political scientists use the term party identification to describe how citizens classify themselves with parties. The enduring subjective identity that people develop with a political party helps explain their voting behavior. It is not the same as party registration, which is the legal process where you declare a party for purposes of voting in primaries nor is it a reflection of how a voter feels about parties in a particular election. Rather, we measure party identification with a series of questions that first ask people whether they see themselves as Democrat, Republican, Independent, or something else. Respondents who say other or something else to the initial question are typically about 2% of the American voting age population. So most people self-classify in this way. Those who answer Republican or Democrat are then asked if they consider themselves strong or not so strong in that attachment. For purposes of simplification, scholars label the not so strong partisans as weak partisans. We just don't tell the respondents that. Those who answered independent to the first question are asked if they consider themselves as closer to the Republican or Democratic Party. There are then three types of independents, those who lean Democratic, those who lean Republican, and pure independents. Let me illustrate this with data from the KBYU Utah College's exit poll on party identification in Utah since 1982. In this figure, I have combined independent leaners with the party towards which they lean. I will demonstrate why in a moment. Note the stability of the response. For example, 
Republicans in Utah have consistently been between 50 and 62 percent of all voters since 1982. National data is similarly stable, but with Democrats outnumbering Republicans. Party identification is important because it is the single best predictor of how we vote. Let me illustrate this with voting in the 2012 presidential election. But the same generalization applies to voting in partisan candidate elections generally, national and state, local, at, at level. Note that over 90% of strong Democrats voted for Barack Obama, and a similar proportion of strong Republicans voted for Mitt Romney. Over 80% of weak partisans voted for their preferred party candidate. But what my colleagues and I discovered in the 1970s is that the independent leaners are as loyal to the party towards which they lean as are the weak partisans, and sometimes more predictably partisan. In other words, independent leaners are closet partisans in terms of how they vote, in terms of how they see the issues, and so forth. Our findings are consistent with data from the 1950s when political scientists first asked the party identification questions to today. Only the pure independents appear without partisan moorings. What we titled our book on this project, The Myth of the Independent Voter, because in fact, most independents are closet partisans. For today's lecture, it's important to emphasize that the strong partisans are the most informed and the most interested citizens and that they vote more frequently than others. But it is also the case that the independents with party leanings are more informed, interested, and participatory than the pure independents. Looking again at data from recent elections, strong partisans have been consistently the most interested in politics and presidential campaigns. In 2012, for example, 63% of strong partisans said they pay attention to politics and elections always or most of the time. On this measure of civic virtue, strong partisans are the most attentive citizens. Just under half of independent leaners pay attention all or most of the time, while weak partisans do so 39% of the time. Pure independents have always been the least interested in politics and campaigns, and in 2012, less than one-third reported paying attention all or most of the time. Another characteristic of civic virtue is the extent to which independents and partisans are knowledgeable about politics. Data from 2012 again show that strong partisans are the most likely to know which party has a majority in the House of Representatives. Leaners are more knowledgeable than weak partisans, and pure independents were notably the least knowledgeable, only one in four answering correctly. Many think that being a partisan means a person is unthinking or uninformed, but I've just shown you that the opposite is true. The most active and attentive citizens are strong partisans. While independent leaners shun the party label in their personal self-identification, they behave much more like strong partisans than pure independents. A widely held misconception is the view that strong partisans or any partisan uh, should be seen in negative terms while viewing independence positively. The data we found in the 1970s, which I have shown remains unchanged, leads to a different conclusion. Independent leaners are behaviorally partisan and exhibit positive citizenship traits, while pure independents are the least active and engaged citizens. It is part of our national mythology that Americans vote for the person and not the party. The reality is that the person we prefer is from our party, and about 90% of Americans have a party preference. While many are aware of our findings, others, like the Gallup poll, continue to release reports as recently as January of this year, claiming a, quote, new record 43% of Americans are political independents, close quote. Buried in the Gallup release was the datum that 11% of their 2014 sample were pure independents, about the same as has been the case since 1952, while the other 32% were, in fact, leaners, who, as research done by my colleagues and me has shown, are consistently partisan in their behavior and attitudes. 
Parties and being a strong partisan also plays an important role in government. The only state in the U.S. with a nonpartisan state legislature is Nebraska. While officially nonpartisan, both major parties endorse candidates, and rarely is a legislator not known as a Democrat or a Republican. And the news media tallies the number of legislators elected from each party. The absence of parties has had some positive benefits in terms of express partisanship in proceedings, but appears to lessen accountability because voters may not be able to hold a party accountable when they do not like what the legislature is doing and when they don't know which party is in control. Within government, parties structure the governing process and bridge the separation of powers, and they can either lead to more polarized politics or help to moderate policy. The current reality in the U.S. is that we live in a time of heightened party polarization. The internal cohesion in the parties on issues and policies has led to a widening of the ideological gap between the parties. Today, there are relatively few representatives in Congress who are moderate. These data that you're seeing now are from Keith Poole and Howard Rosenthal who have developed widely used measures of ideology among elites and the mass public over time. The chart shows that since the 1980s, members of Congress are more and more polarized when compared to those serving in Congress from the 1930s through the 1970s. This has happened in part as a result of legislative districting processes where we now have more solidly partisan districts which means that today's representatives worry more about being primaried, and I'm not talking about what we do in our church for children, that is being defeated by a fellow partisan in a primary, than they worry about a general election opponent from the other party. The result in recent years has been government shutdowns, brinksmanship, and a dwindling number of members of Congress who are willing to work with the other party. The view of parties I am articulating, that they are vital to the functioning of democracy and that they serve important government purposes and that they are unavoidable, was not shared by many of the founders at the time of the Constitutional Convention in 1787 or thereafter. In his presidential farewell address, George Washington described parties as a fire that could consume government, which would elevate candidates seeking absolute power, thereby endangering liberty. John Adams wrote in a letter to Jonathan Jackson that parties were, quote, to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution, close quote. The framers, who were visionaries in many respects, were mistaken in assuming their system would work well without parties. Even during Washington's presidency, Two parties had organized around competing perspectives on politics and government. John Adams, our first vice president, as noted, dreaded parties, but then helped form one, his Federalist Party, and ran against Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party in 1796. Jefferson, like Alexander Hamilton, saw parties as a natural extension of politics. He wrote, in every free and deliberating society, there must, from the nature of man, be opposite parties and violent dissensions and discords. Of one of these, for the most part, must prevail over the other for a longer or shorter time." Close quote. James Madison, who also had been averse to parties, later embraced them in his opposition to Hamilton's proposed First Bank of the United States. Political parties became a means for Madison and other early leaders to attempt to check the actions of the opposing party. Well, why then are parties inevitable? Because we often don't agree on policies and priorities. And as humans, we organize into groups to pursue common aims and interests. As Nancy Rosenblum has written, quote, Someone must create the lines of division over social aims, security, and justice. Party rivalry is constitutive. It stages the battle. There are also constitutional roots for our decentralized two-party system. 
the framers designated a system with single representative districts where the candidate with the most votes in the election represents that district or state. Such winner-takes-all elections have long been seen as leading to a two-party system. Maurice Duverger, a French political scientist, stated what has come to be known as Duverger's Law. As translated from the original French, it is, quote, the plurality one-winner system tends to lead to a two-party system. The proportional representation multi-winner system tends to lead to many mutually independent parties, close quote. Our party system is decentralized because of the constitutional provisions for federalism. Elections in the U.S. are organized around the unit of competition, and most competition is at the state level. U.S. senatorial, gubernatorial, presidential, because of the electoral college, and even congressional elections, because they may not cross state boundaries, have a state focus. The political culture of the state, therefore, its history and its politics, impacts the kind of Republican or Democratic party the state has. Oregon Republicans, for example, are likely more liberal than Utah Democrats on at least some issues. In my view, competition and uh, competition between the parties reinforces the founder's desire to check ambition with ambition and provide the accountability in attend intended in free and fair elections. In this sense, parties are an extra-constitutional check and balance. Well, are there negative consequences from the one-party system? In the U.S. case, the region most identified with one party was the South. The 11 former Confederate states, once known as the Solid South, because they were dominated for several decades by Democrats, were so dominated that some voters in the South were known as yellow dog Democrats, which was understood to mean they would vote for a yellow dog before they would vote for a Republican. Noted political scientist V.O. Key wrote a book in 1949 titled Southern Politics. It is the best summary of a one-party system in operation. Key found that one-party politics tends to be highly personalized or to rely on strong individual leaders rather than ongoing groups. To have limited accountability because there is not a viable electoral alternative. To have erratic and chaotic changes in personnel and policy. To face challenges in disciplining rogue actors and to experience low levels of voter participation. I would posit that some of our problems in Utah politics in recent years have the same root causes that Key found in the American South, including declining voter participation, serious ethical breaches and possibly illegal acts in the office of the Attorney General, and a politics organized more around particular political figures than enduring groups. Having two competitive parties moderates outcomes and reduces corruption. So what do you do as a citizen if you don't like either of the parties? Well, you work to change the one you dislike the least. Parties are permeable organizations. Citizens and leaders can change the orientation of a party. Barry Goldwater and even more Ronald Reagan changed the focus and agenda of the Republican Party. Goldwater lost the 1964 election in a landslide, but Reagan, following in his path, built a coalition in California and then the nation that reshaped the Republican Party to this day. Similarly, Bill Clinton reshaped the Democratic Party in 1992 and 1996, moving it more to the center. The most visible example of this was welfare reform, but it was not limited to that. Let's turn now to the necessity of compromise. Government is necessary because men need it to resolve their conflicts. If everyone agreed with each other, we would not need government. As Madison wrote in Federalist 51, paraphrasing Locke, but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern, neither external nor internal controls would be necessary. 
In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the governed to control the excuse me, control, uh, enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself." Close quote. Government has, as one of its primary purposes, to ensure basic freedoms and liberties against foreign enemies, against domestic factions, and even against majority tyranny. Compromise has been and will remain vital to sustaining our more than 200-year-long experiment with self-government. Compromise is a process of give and take, of blending and adjusting, of accommodating competing interests and views in order to find a position most acceptable to the largest number, or at a minimum, the majority. It is not consensus, for rarely is consensus possible, and to make it the standard makes self-government untenable. The important issues of our time like immigration, taxation, health care, and the size of government are all issues upon which disagreement and divisions are deep. But compromise is often criticized as being unprincipled, too conciliatory, a slippery slope away from core values. It is important to underscore that not all compromises are good or right. Chamberlain's compromise with Hitler over ceding parts of Czechoslovakia to Germany, for example, was a mistake. But to label all compromises as bad is to learn the wrong lesson from history. On many important issues, resolution of a disagreement is only possible with compromise. Now, the media loves conflict and seeks to reinforce it. So it's not surprising that TV and radio commentators often criticize compromise. We also live in a time when our nation is evenly divided, and both sides are seeking to exploit any weakness in the other side for electoral advantage. The high cost of our campaigns and the pressure to raise lots of money also push politicians to take a hard line on issues in order to appease groups who would spend against their reelection if they were to compromise. Compromise is not wrong in public life. To acknowledge the importance of compromise is to recognize that we have different preferences, priorities, and approaches. It's also to acknowledge that everyone knows something and no one knows everything. Nor is it unprincipled. As U.S. Senate Republican leader Everett Dirksen, one of the principal architects of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and the 1965 Voting Rights Act said, quote, I am a man of principle, and one of my principles is to compromise, close quote. A good example of how compromise is achieved um, and how it achieves important purposes is the great compromise between the large and small states at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. James Madison had arrived in Philadelphia with a plan for a new and stronger national government. His Virginia plan set the terms of discussion once the delegates decided to jettison the Articles of Confederation. Madison's plan provided for a bicameral legislature, two houses, an executive chosen by the legislature, and a strong judiciary. Power in both houses in Madison's plan was to be proportionate to the population of the state an advantage for large states and a disadvantage for small states. The Virginia plan would have given the national government more power than it has today. For example, the national government would have been able to veto virtually any state law. Many of the small states were already suspicious of the designs of the large states, and being perpetually outnumbered in the national legislature as they would have been under Madison's plan was not acceptable to them. They proposed a small state plan, known as the New Jersey plan, with a unicameral legislature, an executive removable by state majority, and a more limited judiciary. This plan did not go nearly far enough for Madison and those seeking a stronger national government. There was a great impasse and a heated debate. The debate between the large and small states became so heated that Madison threatened to dissolve the union if small states insisted 
on retaining a disproportionate share of power. And these small states would be left at the mercy of their large neighbors. Gunning Bradford of Delaware countered that the small states would, in that event, find foreign allies. The intensity of the difference in Philadelphia in 1787 prompted George Washington to say, quote, to please all is impossible and to attempt it would be vain, close quote. Well, how was this conflict between the large and small states resolved? It was resolved with what is known as the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. As David Bryan Robertson has recently written, quote, they compromised on the contentious question of representation by devising one legislative chamber based on population and another based on the states as political units. They constructed a new kind of federalism in which the national and state governments would share political authority. They also invented the system of presidential electors and the vice presidency to deal with the problem of presidential selection and replacement. They resolved some intractable disputes simply by delaying implementation, the slave trade, by using symbolic language, the House of Representatives' control of money bills, and by writing ambiguous words and phrases to paper over differences about specific powers with such deliberately imprecise phrases as general welfare or necessary and proper, close quote. What lessons can we learn from the Great Compromise for politics today? First, neither side got all of what it wanted. Each had to concede something to achieve a shared objective. It's hard to imagine the delegates accomplishing anything had they been in today's 24-7 news cycle with Twitter and other modern media operating. Had the positions of the large and small states before the Great Compromise been repeatedly aired it likely would have made it harder to get both sides to compromise and would have reinforced negative perceptions of the other side. The framers needed time and secrecy to carry out their work. They also provide a model for us by not solving every problem. In some areas, like judicial review, they are simply vague. In others, they agreed on what we see today as a very unjust solution, the three-fifths compromise which said that slaves would count as three-fifths of, of a person for purposes of apportionment. Sadly, it took decades for the new nation to resolve the issue of states' rights and slavery. Given the intensity of the views on both sides, the founders made the right political choice to postpone that question. In our celebration of the Constitution, we forget that the framers were themselves politicians who recognized the need to compromise to achieve the important broader goal to form a more perfect union. Note that they did not say they were forming a perfect one. To establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, and to provide for the common defense. Evidence that the framers knew there was more work to be done in improving the Constitution is that they provided for a means of amending it Again, quoting David Bryan Robertson, the resulting constitution, this original compromise, has proved to be remarkably durable and authoritative. It has anchored the national government through spectacular economic growth, social changes, and expansions of democracy and rights that were inconceivable in 1787. It is easy to forget that politicians produced this remarkable document talented, often idealistic politicians, but politicians nevertheless, close quote. There are many examples of compromise in our history, but in recent years, our politics has been marked by a resistance to compromise and a view that to compromise is inappropriate. In addition to the great compromise, which I've already discussed, I will point to a more local and quite recent compromise. One that has gained national attention is labeled by some the Utah Compromise. The law that passed by overwhelming majorities in both houses of the legislature and was signed into law by the governor bans employers or landlords from discriminating against employees or tenants on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. 
while simultaneously excluding religious organizations and their affiliates, such as colleges and charities, from the law. More broadly, the law protects employees from being fired for discussing their religious beliefs, so long as such speech is non-harassing and non-disruptive. The Utah legislature had previously debated and voted on bills banning discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered individuals. But those efforts had not won passage. What was different here was a series of compromises and a willingness to include in the Utah Compromise both protections for religious freedom and for housing and employment rights regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. I'd like to share with you a couple of quotes from President Hugh B. Brown's 1968 commencement address at BYU. President Brown was called as an apostle in 1968 and served in the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints between 1961 and 1970. The quotes are from early in a talk you may know as the God is the Gardener talk. If you not listen to it, I urge you to do so. Here is what President Brown said about politics in May of 1968. You young people are leaving your university at a time in which our nation is engaged in an abrasive and increasingly strident process of electing a president. I wonder if you would permit me, one who has managed to survive a number of these events, to pass on to you a few words of counsel. First, I'd like you to be reassured that the leaders of both major political parties in this land are men of integrity and unquestioned patriotism. Beware of those who feel obliged to prove their own patriotism by calling into question the loyalty of others. Strive to develop a maturity of mind and emotion and a depth of spirit which will enable you to differ with others on matters of politics without calling into question the integrity of those with whom you differ. Allow within the bounds of your definition of religious orthodoxy a variation of political belief. Do not have the temerity to dogmatize on issues where the Lord has seen fit to be silent. I have found by long experience that our two-party system is sound. Beware of those who are so lacking in humility that they cannot come within the framework of one of our two great parties. Strive to develop that true love of country which realizes that real patriotism must include within it a regard for the people of the rest of the globe. Patriotism has never demanded of good men the hatred in the of another country as proof of one's love for his own. The advice of President Brown seems as timely today as it was in 1968. The framers left us with a remarkable structure, one that has been improved through amendment and application. By design, the Constitution fostered a two-party system and the need for compromise. My talk today has emphasized that political parties play an important role one that should be celebrated rather than ridiculed. I also speak today in defense of sensible and principled compromise. The reality in life is that we do not get everything we want. Part of the resistance to compromise comes from a lack of mutual respect and a false sense of confidence despite our very real human fallibility. President Brown added that we have a tendency to dogmatize where we have no basis to do so. Mutual respect is necessary for a democracy to function, and denigrating another's patriotism, misrepresenting an opponent's positions, and refusing to cooperate even on matters on which there is agreement undermine the relationships needed to resolve differences. 
Such actions not only deny the country the benefit that would result from accommodation, but also diminish the prospects for future compromises and rigidify conflict. But the inspired structure of the Constitution is insufficient if we do not appreciate it and use it through our own engagement in politics and government. Soon after the drafting of the Constitution was complete, a lady asked Benjamin Franklin as he left Independence Hall, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? A republic, replied the doctor, if you can keep it. That question is as apt today for all of us as it was then. Meaningful partisan involvement and sensible compromise will help us keep the republic. Thank you very much. This forum address with Dr. David Magleby was given on May 19, 2015.